I'm Katie Karen, and thank you so much for joining my artist studio. I mean, I do, I do think that um, to have a fantasy or to use your imagination, it has to be grounded in reality to a certain extent. I think fantasy and reality are linked in visual art, mm -hmm. and so if it was pure real fantasy with nothing tied to our world, it would almost be hard to kind of uh, feel like you're a part of it. And so having it tied to our reality, I think, um, is what allows you to enter the, enter the space or enter the, enter the piece. It allows it to be uh, more like relatable and then change your perception as you view it and experience exactly. it. Exactly. You know, and I think a lot of science fiction mm -hmm. does that. It takes where we are right now in our culture and it, it, it extends, it predicts or extends into the future what might become or what might be, but it's still tied to the present in some way. That's very I think, interesting. I mean, the cabinets of curiosity were there like you said, to sort of, you know, maybe engage the, the viewer in a, whoa, that's really disturbing, creepy way, mm -hmm. you know, to kind of draw them in. Mm -hmm. But then what they are is they're learning something about their world. They're, they're becoming more worldly by experiencing these wonder rooms or these cabinets. And so I hope that with my installations and my work, I can draw the viewer in through a state of wonder, mm -hmm. possibly, and then they, they spend a little bit more time with the work. Like, how do you get a viewer to spend the same amount of time with a piece of artwork mm -hmm. as they would with a film mm -hmm. or an animation? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's the same as, you know, when viewers go to the museum, the science museum, how long do they really stay with an exhibit? Mm -hmm. And so it's almost a manipulation of the viewer. Like, here, this is something that will draw you in. Okay, now this is what it's really about. And that invites them to be curious and trying to figure out what the message is. Yeah, I do think that by displacing the viewer with uh, whether you know I use a lot of mirrored mylar or just just light or um, multiple modular multiples of complex systems that it's almost like the viewer can't take it in with a quick glance. They mm -hmm. have to spend a little bit more time with the piece to even understand what it is that they're looking at. And so that allows them to sit with the piece just a little bit longer than maybe they would normally. Um, would you say that fear and wonder are related to each other? Definitely. Um, I think I think part of example, you know, the cabinets of curiosity. Some of the things that were part of those those spaces were disturbing and unsettling because, you know, inside the human body, we don't see what's inside of us. Mm -hmm. You know, and and so showing that to the viewer is disturbing because it's, it's a little bit of an unknown, but it's still connected to ourselves. Yeah. And so this idea of the uncanny or something that we're afraid of, it's actually something that's quite close to you, mm -hmm. but is sort of altered in some way. And so I do think that, that wonder and fear are related. Um, I mean, fear being a visceral response to something. Mm -hmm. Wonder also being a, a visceral response to something. Um. Can a microcosm be used to describe an event so catastrophic that it's difficult to comprehend? Radioactive fallout that there is a way to condense them down and create a miniature environment which is representative of that larger than life environment. I think that that's a, that question is um, it's a good one and I don't think it can. I don't, th I, I mean, those sort of events they're just so uh, dramatic and personal and severe. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I, I do think that it is hard to use artifice to really communicate um, those sort of real life events. And I compare it to the, the film industry mm -hmm. that does try to use their medium mm -hmm. to allow the viewer to enter into these moments of, of utter catastrophe. Mm -hmm. and, despair and, or, or whatnot, and I think the uh, films do have, a, they do do a very good job of it, mm -hmm. but there's still a disconnect. You're not actually there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's part of escapism as well, is that we're trying to live our lives maybe passively mm -hmm. through watching or experiencing these things to help us understand and cope with things that we haven't experienced. Yeah, my favorite um, poet is Yeats. And um, one of my favorite lines from one of his poems talks about uh, terrible beauty. Uh, and I feel that 
terrible beauty has been a part of my work from the beginning, even before the work was dealing more with larger concepts. It was, it was c kind of pairing what seems to be beautiful with something that's also harsh or dangerous or uncanny or disturbing. And, and I do think by kind of overlapping those two ideas, I can't help it. It's just the way my work is. And it it's possibly has to do with who I am as a person. Like, I tend to obsess on the dark things, the larger dark things that are happening to our natural world. Um, and it's possible that that's because I'm a product of the 80s and I spent a lot of time, you know, with Earth Day and, you know, growing up feeling like we're, we're killing our environment. Mm -hmm. And maybe that that's a little bit a part of it as well. Um, but I, but I do have this great connection to the natural world. It's a place that I find to be a place of peace and a place of inspiration. And then at the same time, I also, it's, I find it quite disturbing uh, what man continues to do with the natural environment. And so um, they are, it's a terrible beauty that's occurring. Mm -hmm. And so I think it just kind of comes into the, it comes into the work that I make. You know, how we are affecting the natural world, which we are so dependent on. You know, the natural world will adapt mm -hmm. and heal itself mm -hmm. over time. <laughs> but not in, not in my lifetime, mm -hmm. and not in my children's lifetime, or my grandchildren's lifetime. So I think it's a larger question of, you know, can we, can we learn to adapt with nature? And, or are we going to just continue you know, consuming the way, nature the way we are to the point where nature cannot sustain us anymore. And I think that's the bigger that's the bigger issue that concerns me.